all of us follow something. And those things that we follow, those things that we orient our life around, those things our life revolve around, are those things that we would consider to be of supreme value, of surpassing worth, of those things that we would consider to be preeminent among all of the other values that we have. Many of us, if we were to evaluate our own lives and we would see what it is that we dream about when we have a few moments to think, when we orient our time and our money around, if we were to do an audit of our, of our bank statements perhaps, we would find those things that we understand to be truly and ultimately and infinitely valuable in our own minds and our own hearts. The author to Hebrews is making the case in these first four verses, as he is through the rest of the book, he is laying out the supreme worth, the infinite value, the absolute preeminence, the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you have your Bibles open, and I hope you will, Hebrews chapter one, this is what we see. He has become as much superior far more valuable, infinitely more worthy. It's a word that's repeated in this letter. I just want you to think for a moment about the superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ that when he was born of a virgin that he was at that time older than his father and his mother. In his infancy, he startled a king. Kingmakers from the east came to worship him. In his boyhood, he astonished even the most learned doctors of the day. And in his manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He healed the multitudes without medicine, and he never charged for his services. He never wrote a book, and yet at the same time, more books in the world have been written about him than about anybody else. He never wrote a song, and yet more songs are sung of him that are sung of anybody else. He was born contrary to the laws of nature as we understand it, born yet of a virgin under the law. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the ruler of rulers. He's the wisdom of God and the power of God. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Herod couldn't kill him. Satan couldn't seduce him. Death couldn't destroy him. Sin could not restrain him. And the grave could not hold him. This is the Jesus of supreme worth that we worship. Why are we committed to Christ then? Why does he become the figure around which our whole lives revolve? It's because he is supreme. The author of Hebrews is pointing us back to Jesus. And he's saying that there's something off balance, that whenever, whenever something seems a little off kilter in our lives, whenever there's something that is lacking in our Christian experience, the place that we need to go is right back to the center of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to look at ourselves and not to look at our circumstances, but to take 10 looks at Christ for every look at ourselves. Larry Richards put it this way, we can come to know Jesus better, but we can never find anything better than knowing Jesus. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews is trying to guide us back into. Let me give you a little context just so we understand what the author is writing here. The letter is written to the Jews who had grown up with all of the vestiges of Mosaic religion. And he's saying, why would you ever go back to that which is inferior with all of its ceremonies and all of its practices when you can have that which is superior of infinite value and worth, that which all of those things is pointing, the fulfillment of those other things. You see, he's writing to those who had heard the gospel, those who had been raised in the synagogues, those who upon hearing the gospel repented and believed and had continued to follow Jesus. And yet, even in their act of allegiance to the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, that if they were to continue to follow Jesus, they would be de synagogued They would be disowned by parents. In fact, their parents would hold a funeral service for them and they would conclude that I don't have a son anymore. I don't have a daughter anymore. Continue to follow Jesus. The author is underscoring to these believers that even in these things, Jesus is better. That even if you lose everything in this world, including your closest loved ones, Jesus is better. Jesus 
is better. That he is superior to every other earthly love and he is superior to every other earthly loyalty. He is superior to the prophets. He is superior to the angels. He is superior to Moses. He is superior to the priesthood. He is superior to the sacrifices. Everything about Jesus is infinitely and vastly superior. Therefore, brothers and sisters, look to him, listen to him, live for him, love him, learn him, labor for him. Your entire life must revolve around him. This is the whole thing thrust of the letter to the Hebrews. And this is what's captured in a nutshell in the first four verses. The entire book of Hebrews is summarized in these four verses. And there's no less than six ways that the Lord Jesus Christ is of infinite value, superior to all things, preeminent and surpassing in glory. Six things. We're going to see, first of all, beginning in verse 1, that Christ is superior in his proclamation. Follow along with me. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. What we see is the contrast that's emphasized by that word at the beginning of verse 2, but... It's a contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant, between the law and the gospel, between what we would understand as the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we notice a couple of things here in verse 1. We notice, first of all, that these are one organic whole, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the old and the new covenant. The law and the gospel are one organic whole because of two things, because of divine revelation and because of divine authority. We see in verse 1 that when we're talking about the revelation that came long ago, it was God who spoke. And we see the same thing in verse 2. In these last days, he has spoken. That in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is the one who is speaking. And so we have a high value of the Bible. Of 39 books in the Old Testament, of 27 in the New Testament, all existing together, diverse in their authors, diverse in their aims, diverse in their context, and yet all united as one organic whole and having supreme authority over all people everywhere, not because the church has provided enough evidence, not because of our own reason, not because science has proven it, but because God is its author, because God has spoken. He has spoken in the Old Testament. He has spoken in the New Testament. And as such, all of God's word is God's word. And when it is read and sung and preached, it is God speaking by his spirit. As such, it is not only divine revelation, but it is divine authority. And yet, even in this unity, there is diversity. As some people put it, even in this continuity, there is yet some discontinuity. Verse 1, we see here probably the best summary of what the Old Testament really is. That it is God speaking to our fathers by the prophets at many times and in many different ways. Almost 4,000 times we see in the Bible the phrase, thus says the Lord. This is ultimately what the Old Testament is. It is God speaking in a particular way to particular people at particular times. We notice, first of all, that God spoke long ago. What does that mean by long ago? Well, if we take Job as being, for instance, the first book written in the Bible, then perhaps that would place us back about 2,200 years. Nehemiah was most likely the last book of the Bible written, and that was about 400 years prior to the coming of Christ. We're looking at a span of 1,800 years. The Psalms, in fact, took almost 1,000 years to write, if you look at the various authors. Nevertheless, we're talking about millennia of revelation by those appointed by God, or through those appointed by God to his people. But we notice also that it was not just long ago, it was also at many times, literally in many portions. That in the Old Testament we find 17 historical books, 5 wisdom books, 17 prophetic books, 39 books in all, all of which reflecting different times, different settings, different situations, and yet all of them come together in one. And yet God spoke not only at many times, but notice in many ways. He spoke audibly. He gave visions. There were angelic messengers. He even spoke through animals. 
Each one of these is a piece of a puzzle that together reveal, that paint a portrait when they're all put together of the mystery of God's glorious plan of redemption that is all pointing to something or rather somebody greater. And we see finally that God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. The men chosen to speak God's words to the leader of God's people. And as they do, all of these patterns and all of these prophecies and all of these proclamations are all announcing one thing over and over and over again. Messiah is coming. The seed of the woman is coming to crush the serpent's head, to bless the nations, to reign as a king. All of these things are preaching a message. And yet the question is, who is he? Who's the Messiah? This is the mystery of the Old Testament. So the beginning of verse two then, but in these last days, God has spoken. He's spoken in the same way that he spoke to our fathers by the prophets. He has spoken yet today in these last days by his son. Notice the contrast. The God spoke, verse one, long ago, but now he has spoken in these last days. In the Old Testament, that phrase, the last day, is referring to the coming of Messiah. Now, according to the Old Testament, that would be viewed as one event, the Messiah coming and establishing his kingdom. But it's kind of like if you were to drive to Colorado up onto a mountain range, from a distance it looks like a range is really just one giant mountain, but as you come closer to it, you find that that range begins, it's full of multiple mountains, and so it is with biblical prophecy. So what we find is that these last days have a beginning and they have an end, that they have an inauguration and they have a consummation. That it begins in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ and it ends at his return. That the Old Testament anticipation of these last days has been inaugurated by Christ, which means that you and I, brothers and sisters, find ourselves now in the last days. We find ourselves now in those days inaugurated by Christ, awaiting his coming, whereby he is the highest and fullest revelation of God's plan of redemption in the world. That we are in the last days. But notice also the contrast in verse 1. In the Old Testament, God spoke to our fathers, but look at verse 2, what the apostle says. He says that he has spoken now to us. God is not done speaking in the Old Testament. What God has said to us is superior to what God has said to the prophets. Why? Because in these last days, he spoke not by the prophets, verse 1, but according to verse 2, he has spoken by his son. It's the one and the same message in the New Testament as we have in the Old Testament. That what God has said to us in his son is a superior message, not because it's a different message, but because it is the final message. It is the culmination of the whole message of the Bible. F.F. F. Bruce put it this way, the story of divine revelation is a story of progression up to Christ. But there is no progression beyond him. This point has essentially two sides to it. It's not just that the Old Testament leads up to Christ. That's true. We've established that. All of the patterns and the prophecies and the proclamations were all pointing to him. But it's also true that once we get to Christ, God has not held back some greater revelation of himself in this world. He has given us in Christ everything that we need to know to know him and to do his will, beginning with repentance and faith in the gospel. We don't need more revelation than we have received in Christ. We don't need any more visions. We don't need any more talking donkeys. We don't need any more angelic messengers because the highest and the fullest form of divine revelation has come in the person and the work of the Son, Jesus Christ. Did you notice here that long ago in verse one, it was many times and in many ways, but now in these last days, God has spoken but in one way, and it is through Jesus Christ. 
It is him to whom we look. It is him to whom we listen. It is his word that we go to. And in all of our experiences, in our measurements, in our evaluations of this world and of our lives, we bring it all to subordination to the word of Christ. There is no higher word. There is no final word. His word is supremely valuable, as is his message. It's the greatest message. We have no greater message to give as the church. That when the church stops preaching, the fulfillment of all of God's promises in the person and the work of Christ, of his coming, of his life, death, resurrection, and of his return, and of the hope that sinners might have of new life and perfect righteousness in him by faith alone. Oh, when the church stops preaching that, that is a dead church. I don't care how much social activity we have. I don't care how much political fervor we might muster. I don't care how much mercy we might give out to our neighbors. If we do not preach Christ, then we have nothing to preach. He's the apex of revelation. He's the highest point of revelation. He's the final revelation such that there is nothing to get from God beyond Christ himself. But Christ is not only superior in his proclamation, he is also superior in his possession. Look at this. He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Everything that exists belongs to him. And when he comes, the father is gonna sign over the title deed to all of the new creation to Christ. It will be his. Well, where do we get this? One of the places in the Bible, it's, the it's one of the favorite passages for the apostles to preach. You find it all over. Peter preached from it. Paul preached from it. The author of the Hebrews preaches from it. The apostles loved preaching from Psalm 2. Turn there with me. Psalm 2. We're considering this idea that Christ is superior in his possession. What it is he possesses. Psalm chapter 2. It's a relevant text for our own day. We see in verses one through three that the nations are raging against God and his anointed. See that there in verse two? But who is God's anointed? Well, after laughing in verse four, God speaks in verse five and he says, let me tell you who my anointed is. My anointed, verse six, is my appointed king. And in verse seven, my anointed is my begotten son. God says, it is the purpose of my son to rule and reign as my appointed king. And what is it that he'll possess? We'll look at verse 8. The nations will be his heritage, and the ends of the earth his possession. He says to the son in verse 9, just ask, and I'll give it to you. Because all that the son asks on the basis of his righteous life, and all that the son asks on the basis of his sufficient sacrifice, the father won't deny him. All for which the Son asks, the Father provides. There's never been a prayer that the, pr that the Son has prayed that the Father has not answered. You and I are here today and we are Christians because the Son has asked his Father for us and it pleased the Father to give you to him. You are here, new life, a new creation because Jesus always has his prayers answered by the Father. He says, just ask and I'll give it to you. He's superior in his possession. Colossians 1, he is, Paul says, the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't mean that he was just created before everything. It's kingly language. In the verses before that, you may remember that we've been transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. The firstborn language is meant to be understood in the context of a kingdom. What is the firstborn of a kingdom? He's the one who inherits everything. The kingdom is his. And so it is, Paul continues, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things were created through him and all things were created for him. He possesses all things. He will possess everyone. He will possess everything. And he will do so either by the way of justification or he will do so by condemnation. He will possess everything either by salvation or he will possess everything by severity. He will possess everything either by righteousness imputed or he will possess you by wrath imparted. But he will possess everything at the end of the age. The Father will give it to him. Oh friend, Psalm chapter 2 
He is the king of kings. That's why verse 10, the psalmist says, therefore you kings, you rulers, kiss the son. Because you're not really a king. You're not the king of kings. You're subordinate authorities. Even the highest earthly authorities are subordinate authorities. To the son, he possesses everything. Friend, if you're here, to kiss the son means to give him fealty, loyalty, allegiance. It is to abandon all other loves and loyalties and to recognize that Christ is supremely valuable and infinitely worthy of the whole of your life. Do not curse the son. Oh, friend, kiss the son. Give your life to him. Because if you will not give it in this life, he will take it in the next, and you will bow the knee. Do not wait until that day. Trust in Christ. Kiss the Son. He is superior in his possession, but we see also back in Hebrews chapter 1 that he is thirdly superior in his power. Going back to Hebrews chapter 1. He's not only the heir of all things, but through whom also he created the world. He is the firstborn heir because he is also the almighty creator. He possesses the whole world because he created the whole world. And that word world at the end of verse 2, it's not the, world, it's not the word that's commonly used throughout the New Testament. The Greek word commonly used is cosmos, where we get our word the cosmos. It refers to all of the physical aspects of creation, all held and knit together by, by God. No, it's referring to a different thing here. The word that is used here is the word ionos. It's where we get our word eons, ages, that he is the creator of the ages, that he is the creator not just of the physical things, he is the creator of all things that we cannot see, of time and space and energy and everything. Everything belongs to him because he has created everything. That's why John writes, all things came into being through him and apart from him nothing has been made that has been made. In other words, just as you were to go home and turn over any of your appliances and see made in China, you turn over anything in this created realm and it says made by Christ. It all is from him and it is to him and it is for him. Furthermore, we see elsewhere in the Bible that the Father is ultimately the architect, the Son is the agent. This is what we see when we read John chapter 1, back in Genesis chapter 1. It is the Father who has designed all of creation. It is the Son who speaks and executes by the Spirit's power. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Christ is superior in his power because he is the agent of God in creation. He is the one who has created everything and as such he owns everything including you and I. He is superior in his power, but notice he keeps on going. Fourthly, he is also superior in his person. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. We read in Psalm 19 that the creation reflects the glory of God. But here we see that Christ is no mere reflection of God's glory in the way that the moon is a mere reflection of the rays of the sun. We see that Christ is the radiance of God's glory. And that word radiance literally means the outshining of a bright light. Its root word is, is a word that indicates dawn or sunrise. For many of you, perhaps some of you go hunting and you go out early in the morning and it's, and it's really cold and you're sitting in your deer stand. You know what it's like when the sun comes up and the light hits the horizon and you begin to feel the warmth. I wasn't a hunter. I played golf in high school. But there were many mornings where I would be on the course when it was still dark, still cold, still wet, and when the sun would come up, oh, you'd feel the tips of your fingers begin to thaw. That's the image that we have here. He is the outshining of bright light, the dawn, the sunrise of the glory of God. The highest revelation of who God is, a, a flood of resplendent light. The glory of God is, 
is ultimately what he's talking about here. It's the, it's, the, it's the shining forth of the attributes of God, of who God is. It's the manifestation of who he is in his goodness. And so what this is saying then is that Jesus is the radiance of his glory. He is the greatest manifestation of God's glory to us. That's why we read in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. What kind of glory? Glory is the only son from the father full of grace and truth. How do we know grace? How do we know truth? How do we know the glory of grace? How do we know the glory of truth? Because we beheld the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son. That's what the author is saying. In his first coming, he came as a humble servant. All of that glory was veiled in human flesh. The word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, we sing. The glory of God is veiled, and yet from time to time in his earthly ministry, you would see God pull those curtains back. Then in the miracles of Jesus, we see the glory of God manifested. That's why the apostle John says in John chapter two, right after Jesus turned water into wine in Cana, he said this, the first of his signs, Jesus did in Galilee, and what did he do? Manifested his glory. Pulling the curtains back giving us a glimpse into who God is. Oh, friends, listen, when you read through the Gospels, here's what you need to understand about miracles. Miracles are not an interruption of the normal order of things. Sin is an interruption of the normal order of things. Miracles are a glimpse into the power of God restoring things as they ought to be and as they will be in the new creation. That's how you think about miracles in the Gospels. Blindness, lameness, sin, disease, abnormal, invaders into God's creation. Sight, wellness, worship, that's God's normal. And that is what he's restoring, beginning now with us in his church, and will one day fill the whole earth with his glory through his redeemed. We see it also the veil pulled back, not just in his miracles, but in his transfiguration. You remember Peter, James, and John saw the manifestation of, of God's glory in, in the transfiguration. In Mark chapter 9, it says that his garments were radiant and intensely white as no one on earth could possibly bleach them. Every time I pull out one of my undershirts, I look at it and I go, ugh. <laughs> not so the glory of Jesus. He is not like a grimy old undershirt. It is a, a purity unlike anything we could see or imagine. And that glory which was revealed to Peter and James and John, that little glimpse, the pulling back of the curtains, that is the, that is the glory in which he now exists in his glorified humanity. Oh, listen to what John says, Revelation chapter one. And in the midst of the lampstands, those are the churches, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. Oh, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, like a refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. That is what Jesus is doing right now. And we've not yet seen it, except in glimpses through his revelation and his incarnation and the teachings of his apostles. But one day, when Jesus comes back in his second coming, in the consummation of God's plan of redemption, there will be no veiling his glory, there will be no muting his glory. In his first, in his first coming, he appeared but as a humble servant, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. In his second coming, he will appear as a glorious and a conquering king. That's why in Revelation it says that he will come riding on a white horse, on white clouds, with the armies of heaven following him in fine linen, white and pure, and he will sit on on his great white throne and the earth and the sky will flee from his glory. Is that the Jesus that your life revolves around? Or do you have some domesticated suburban Jesus that exists really only to make your life a little bit more comfortable in this life? A little rabbit's foot Jesus. Or is your Jesus one who has
flames in his eyes, pure white, and with a voice that is able to shake the very creation. Is that the Jesus that you worship? Well, he's not only the radiance of the glory of God, but he's also the exact imprint of his nature. That word imprint, it would have been an old Greek word. The way that they would have used it in the ancient world was a mark or impression made upon an object like a coin. You may remember back in, in the Gospels when, Jesus, when they're asking Jesus about paying taxes to Caesar. What does he say? Whose likeness is on the coin? It's the same image here. The coin belongs to Jesus, or the, the coin belongs to Caesar, thank you. Just, <laughs> pastor died in the pulpit. <laughs> the coin belongs to Caesar because it bears his image. You know what Caesar is like because you see him on the coin. Well, it's the same kind of, of word that's being co-opted here by the author. Such that Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That there is no other version of God other than the God that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15, Paul says he's the image of the invisible God. In the very next chapter, he says, in him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. There is nothing that can be known of the Father's glory that is not also true of the Son. He is the, as we confess, in the church through the ages has confessed, he is the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is superior in his person, but he is also superior in his providence. That he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That word upholds is in the present tense. It's not something he used to do, but isn't doing anymore. He didn't just set it in motion and sit back and watch. We're not deists. It is something he is doing every moment of every day right now. He is the one who is moment by moment keeping the cosmos from collapsing in on itself. Elsewhere, the Bible teaches that it's in him that we live and move and have our being. And so Jesus is not like that old Greek god Atlas, bearing the dead weight of the world. The language here implies movement and progress of pure act, moving everything to its intended goal and purpose. Therefore, when we read that he is upholding the universe by the word of his power, we don't need to just think simply about atoms and molecules. We need to be thinking also about all that he's accomplishing in redemption. We need to think not only about creation, we need to think also about new creation and all that he's doing. And this means that Christ has saved you and that according to the preeminence and the superiority of his providence, because of the word of his power whereby he upholds everything, the Christ who has saved you is saving you. He will save you totally, completely, entirely, and finally by the word of his power. He is working all things for your good. Do you believe that? And he's doing so according to the word of his power, that his divine power, Peter says, has granted us all that pertain to life and godliness. We're not lacking in the resources that we need to persevere to the end. We have it all in the power of Christ. That's why the old confession says that the creator of all things in his infinite power and wisdom upholds, directs, arranges, and governs all creatures and all things. And this providence in a general way includes all creatures, but in a special way, it takes care of his church and arranges all things for her good. Christ is superior in his providence. You can trust that you will get all the way home safely because Christ is upholding you by the power of his word. And he is working all things to that glorious end that you can know and believe because of this truth right here that Christ not only loves you, but that he will hold you fast. Because the very same word that created the eons is the same word that has saved you and redeemed you and transformed you and it is the very same word that sustains you and it's the very same word that will get you all the way home. That is the word of his power. He is superior in his providence.
but he's also superior in his purification. That after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That we need to understand this language of purification against the backdrop of the Old Testament. And when we do, and we see all of the sacrifices and all of the laws and the ceremonies, what we see is at least two things. This is what purification means. It means, first of all, the removal of sin. Elsewhere in his letter, the author of Hebrews is going to say, apart from the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. That Christ has offered himself and shed his own blood that you and I would no longer have our sins counted against us, but would have that very debt carried away as far as the east is from the west. But it doesn't only mean the removal of sin, it also means the cleansing of our conscience. Not the cleansing of our body, but of our conscience before God. That even when Satan would seek to leverage the law of God against us and to accuse us and to show us all of the ways in which we have fallen short of the glory of God, the law no longer functions like that for us because the law points us to Christ and in all the ways that he has fulfilled the law on our behalf and by which we are now counted righteous in him. And so the law is not fearful to us. It is not a foe. It is a friend because it reminds us of the imputed righteousness of Christ and of his sacrifice in our behalf such that no more more atonement, no more purification, no more blood is needed. You can stop beating yourself up. You can stop flagellating yourself. You can stop, you can stop preparing self-atonement. You don't have to do it anymore because Christ has paid everything for you. That's why we sing, isn't it? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Oh, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. Oh, and there may I, though I am as vile as he, oh, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood will never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Amen. Ever since by faith I saw that stream, that thy flowing wounds supply, oh, redeeming love has been my theme, and it will be till I die. And when this poor lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave then in a nobler and sweeter song I will sing thy power to save Christ is superior in his purification nothing else is needed which is why we read in verse 4 that he has sat down He's done. He's done his work. And that leads us to our final point, that Christ is superior in his position. Why did he sit down? So I just said it's obvious. His work is finished. And he has sat down not needing to make any more atonement. He has laid down his life once for all. Nothing else is needed. And now he has been, he is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. The right hand is the, that's the seat of power and of authority. The apostle Peter writes this, 1 Peter 3, that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God. And now he has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authority, and powers all having been subjected to him. Why is the author of Hebrews focusing so much on angels? Well, you've got to understand that in a Jewish worldview, you have a very high view of angels. I think for many of us Christians, we should probably have a higher view of angels than what we do. They have a high view of angels such that it became an error in the church. Angel worship was a thing. You may remember Paul in Colossians chapter 2 rebukes the church for angel worship. But here Peter is saying that even the angels are subjected to him. That he has been given, verse 4, a more excellent name than theirs. 
And that on account of his atoning work on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ possesses in himself all of the qualifications to be the mediator between God and man. That is the name that he has received. That is a consequence of humbling himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross that God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Do you see the formula here in Hebrews 1? And Peter uses it, and Paul uses it, that the name that he has inherited, the throne that he sits on, the dominion that he enjoys, the authority that he exercises over all things everywhere, he does so as a perfectly qualified mediator, that is mediating God to men and men to God, and he does it because of his humility and coming, putting on flesh, living life under the law, and dying in our place. This is the paradox of the gospel that he who humbles himself will be exalted, but he who exalts himself will be humbled. Well, where do we get that? Jesus has given us a three-dimensional prophecy of the very law of God in this respect, that he has been exalted because he humbled himself, that he enjoys his heavenly session in all of his glory, and he makes intercession for us, able to save us to the very uttermost. He has authority over all things, and he will one day get the deed to the whole new creation at his return from the Father. He does all of that. Why? Because he asked the Father for a people, and the people and the Father was pleased to give us to him, provided he fulfill the covenant of works and obeying the law perfectly and of laying down his life, exhausting every curse of the law in our place so that we would know nothing but the very blessings that were promised to Abraham of inclusion into the people of God, of dwelling with God, of him being our God and of us being his people. All because of Christmas. That, that's what Christmas is about. It's not about presents. It's not about cinnamon rolls. It is about the revelation of the glory of God in the manifold supremacy of Christ.